institutionalized in the political, legal, and administrative structures of the country. And not only that, and this is Dr. Mahathir's contribution, in a craftily interwoven jigsaw of reinforcing practices. As you will see, I will present in a while. Okay, initially, at the inception of our nation, the uh, Malayan aristocracy at that time used up the Malayan agenda. Today, an expanded, broadened Malay elite class used up the entire Malaysian agenda. Okay? This is my postulate. These are my first two postulates. Right? I start from here. Now, compare with what we had in South Africa. Right? In South Africa, the uh, elite of the minority uh, race, the whites, 18% of the population in 1980, right, control the country. Here, it's not the minority, but it's the elite of the majority that controls. This is a significant difference and, and accounts for the difference in the nature of the racist regime. Because a lot of people cannot see the, the synonym there. Okay? Uh, the, because they were a minority race in South Africa, the whites needed overt and brash methods of control. Right? And we know all about that. Whereas over here, right, you don't need because you know they already with the with the infrastructure they already are in control. What they need is to maintain that control. Subtle methods are used. The majority in South Africa had little leverage in the economy. However, in Malaysia, the minority has significant leverage within the economy. South African apartheid administration was manned entirely by whites. In 1977, 500,000 whites manned all the supervisory positions and above in the South African administration. And that's how policy was operationalized and control was maintained in day-to-day -day Malaysian administration is at least 85% Malay in uh, ethnic composition. Okay? Similarly, there are two education systems in South Africa, one for the whites and one for the blacks. We have two education systems in our country. I will show you a little bit more detail as we go for Malays and for non-Malays. South, South Africa had you know, all these draconian laws to control with. And, you know, the, uh, uh, sorry, the Population Registration Act, which, which uh, classified into whites, blacks, colors, and Asians. We don't have an act like that, but equally, we have that practice. Wherever you go, whatever form you take up, that's what you have to fill up. Bangsa, yeah? Line line is another bangsa now. You know, you have three plus line line. Okay? Uh, and, and, and so on, you know, a number of uh, uh, acts. Malaysia, you know, for its part, has the Internal Security Act, the Publishing and Printing Presses Act, Official Secrets Act, the Seditions Act, the New Freedom of Assembly Act. All this to muzzle any and all dissent in the country. Okay? Now, South African uh, uh, racism readily recognized as immoral, but not so with the racism that we have in our country. Okay, the vehicle. How has this come to be? It is, again, another postulate of ours. The article 153 has been the vehicle for this to occur. Okay? And has has resulted in a de facto two-tier citizenship in this country. We can argue the words, you know, we can argue, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the terms, but the fact is, and you know, and that's what this, this, this uh, forum is really all about, right? 
and it has, uh, sorry, it has provided the Malay elite with the vehicle for institutionalizing racism in Malaysia. Okay. Okay. I want to, uh, you know, just talk a little bit about the manifestations of institutionalization. As I said, the way it is entrenched in the political, legal, and administrative structures. Yeah. In terms of the treatment that you know we uh, encounter or we receive whenever we meet up with the system, treatment in state policies. There is a new economic policy. Okay. Two objectives. One was to restructure society to eliminate identification of race with occupation. Very noble. Eradication of poverty. Very noble. But none of the er uh, poverty eradication measures really reach the normal poor. None. Right? This, this was one, one leg of it. The other is the uh, elimination of identification of race with occupation. It eliminated maybe some, but it created others. Right? New identifications of race with occupation. In key areas that's required for the control of public policy leaders. By the elite, they needed this. Right? So the administration, the judiciary, the armed forces, the police, the academia in public universities. Right? New identification of occupation with race. Why? Because this was needed to control public policy. Okay. Here are just you know, some statistics. May not be exactly you know, uh, new. But the interesting thing is this. You see how the control you know, in the uh, management group versus the middle group and the lower groups you know, within the uh, government administration, how it increases. And what this says basically is, um, you know, control entirely was was uh, taken up by the uh, elite control entirely. Yeah, there you have it. This was a key process to ensure absolute control over the national resource by the Malay elite. Okay. Don't have to say much more about that. The ministers and the ministries control the eligibility for and award of these projects. We see that happening today. Feed lock, uh, uh, we call it feed lock, Malaysian feed lock center. National, I national feed lock. National feed lock center. I have something to say about that in a moment. Mm. Uh, so, all the development programs, all excludes non Malays. Systematically, right? All those state development agencies, you know, regional development agencies, land development agencies, all exclude systematically. And uh, the national resource is used cleverly through the workings of the interlaced activities of all these agencies, government-linked companies, government investment companies, economic planning units, federal cabinet of ministers, and so on, all of that. Right? Very well interwoven network, the way they work. And, uh, uh, okay, I'm actually wanting to talk about the national feedlock property because it clearly tells you how this whole thing works. I'll come to that in a moment. Okay, that is treatment uh, in state policies. Now, treatment by the police. Now, being from Indra, this is not anything uh, new for us. We are all the time hounded by the police. Not because they're doing anything wrong, but because they're doing something right. And they don't want that. You see, all that I'm saying, if any of you can say I'm telling a lie, then you are right, the police are after us for a good reason. But we talk about the issues of the Indian poor, Indian marginalized. Right? And, uh, okay, uh, okay, I am a little bit ahead, but okay, the point here is that 
Okay, there's a significant uh, underclass that has developed as a result of the, um, the policies of the past. Significant underclass among the Indians. And um, worst forms of human rights violations are occurring against these, um, you know, like we have well-known one case, Kukan. But we have so many others. Shot because they're suspected or killed in custody, right? And, uh, and in our opinion, this is happening because they are soft targets. Soft targets, you know, minority, and uh, nobody will speak up for them. Okay. Yeah, that's in uh, custody, killed. You know, the story goes like this. The suspect was acting suspiciously. There was a car chase. And then, uh, you know, they fired at us. <coughs> then we fired back. Then we went and opened up their boat and we saw parangs and guns in there. This is, next time there's a shooting, you just read the story. It'll always fall within this, uh, what I'm saying here. Okay? So minorities again, counted by the police. Okay? Again. More than 60% of the inmates in Malaysian prisons are of Indian origin. So if you're having so many uh, you know, custodial deaths, you can imagine how many of them will be of uh, Indian descent. Okay, treatment by the judicial system. The judicial system is part of the bullying infrastructure to keep the minority down. We, we say particularly the Indians because of their soft targets. Okay? Hindu activists are hounded for any show of defiance. Recently, I don't know how many of you are aware, on the 27th of February 2011, we called for a march against unknown racism, solidarity march of the people against unknown racism. Right? A few thousand people tried to get through to KLCC. 109, uh, in our estimate, were arrested. 54 are being prosecuted, and they're still being prosecuted, right? Now, let's say you had how many? 60 people, 61 people arrested? How many of them are being prosecuted? Now, how many of you know how many of them are being prosecuted? Why are the Hindra activists being prosecuted? Okay? Again, for no more than defined. 